Welcome to the Main Street Business Insight Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Wagner, Chief Program Officer at Main Street America, a nonprofit leading a collaborative movement dedicated to strengthening communities through place-based economic development and community preservation. Each week, join me as I travel the country and take a deep dive into the personal journeys of downtown and neighborhood entrepreneurs, the stories that far too often go unnoticed and unheard. Whether you're a small business owner who wants to learn from your peers or a community leader looking to better support your local business base, Main Street Business Insights is here to provide you with the tools, strategies, and personal stories to help you and all of your Main Street businesses thrive. So subscribe now and tune in every Wednesday to get inspired by the individuals driving our communities forward. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Main Street Business Inside podcast. So this week's episode finds me still in my home studio, which is a real bummer, especially since my guest is in Adelaide, South Australia, which not only has great main streets, but frankly, some of the best vineyards around. And trust me, I've tasted them. But enough of that. Despite my regrets for not being there in person uh, to talk to our guest, it's so wonderful in this episode that we're going to be able to explore Main Street and small business ownership really from an international perspective with my friend and colleague, David West, principal consultant, premier retail marketing, a leading expert and author on commercial district management, and really one of the founders behind Australia's Main Street movement. Now, before we go into this, a little bit of background. Dave and I got introduced uh, really a few years back when he was hosting one of the first conferences in Main Street in South Australia. And I was honored um, to be an invitee and go out and talk about our Main Street work here in the U.S. And not only was David a wonderful and gracious host and touring all around, but uh, has been really a foundational part of amazing efforts to support commercial district management and revitalization throughout not only South Australia, but really the world. And I'll get into that in a sec. So we we have a lot to explore uh, on this week's um, episode and our first ever international podcast episode to learn more about perhaps similarities and differences in our work and that of small businesses between our two Main Street efforts. So welcome to the podcast, David. So good to have you here. Thank you very much, Matt. Great to be here. Yeah. And and David's got a great background. Mm-hmm. I could use better, but you know, <laughs> David's much more professional uh, than than I am. Um, you are, in my eyes, one of the originators in the Main Street uh, management movement, okay? Uh, with more than 30 years of experience in analyzing and managing and marketing main streets and shopping centers, like in the beautiful city of Adelaide, which just a tourism plug. If you're going to go to Australia, Sydney, great, Melbourne, great, but go to Adelaide. Okay. Um, as well as being one of the, uh, the author of Main Street Management, Successful Retail Strategies. And we're going to put a plug in the show notes uh, for everyone. Get the book. It's great. Fantastic. But we always like to start, David, the, the show really with, with folks just telling us about their journey. And you, you can relate so well to Main Street directors and commercial district revitalization directors here in the U.S. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what it was like for you. Yeah, thank you, Matt. I think in, in Australia, the Main Street movement sort of had two series like there was sort of going back to the 80s when they were very active and doing a lot of things and then I think it went a little bit quiet but then Main Street Australia came through and sort of started to revitalize things and and I made sure that I tapped in with Main Street Australia after I uh, got involved but really my background was uh, in the shopping center industry and uh, managing large Westwood shopping centers and um, after I'd been with them for around 10 years and knowing how they run the centres, you know, very detailed and, you know, retail is detail is so important. You know, you've got to present yourself to the customer and, um, you know, you've got to make sure that the, the welcome mat is out every morning and, uh, you know, you're welcoming those customers. So I moved to Run the Mall, which is a pedestrian uh, precinct in Ayla, pedestrian only precinct and in the CBD had around 25 million customers. And of course, with 25 million customers, things are changing all the time. And uh, that's 25 million a year, um, changing all the time. And and uh, so I knew that 
I had to have some sort of management control and looking at the details of how do you make sure that the customer has a great experience when they come. And uh, so that sort of got me involved in how do I, from what I know about shopping centres and detail and, and how to look after a customer space, how do I take that to a, a main street or a pedestrian area like Rundle Mall? And that really got me started. And I, I, and I certainly was looking at Main Street America as a resource and also the Association of Town Centre Management back then. And I, I was looking at the language that you use and, and I was really impressed with, you know, that looking at the organisation and management part and, and that, that's sort of really been my passion. That, that's, it's fascinating. I mean, one, one of the big things that I had to learn in our first sort of meetings was some, someone a little bit about like language that we use. So when you say mall, I think instantly in America, we think of, you know, like these big, huge shopping centers, enclosed malls and not necessarily like a main street in terms of it doesn't have maybe auto traffic or whatever. Is that is that the case in in Australia, how people like frame the language of malls? Yes. I mean, I think if we say pedestrian only more, we generally talk about shopping centers as being shopping centers and um, pedestrian malls or a mall would be an outdoor mall. So run a mall is like 500 metres long, but it has a 1,000 businesses and it, in the precinct and it has, um, you know, f department stores, five department stores and lots of little specialties and arcades. Uh, so it's really unique and it's um, right in the middle of the CBD. So you have a lot of um, university students, you have your city workers, um, you have a lot of, you know, tourists and visitors because the hotels are so close. It's a really busy, you know, hub of the of the city the the interesting thing is and i've I, I was able to walk you know through there is that the the scale is very much like a main street scale it's not like a bunch of even though there are certainly taller buildings in in adelaide like it truly fits sort of a scale of what we think about main street here in the u.s yeah, i think the first one that i linked in to try, try and find the similarities was santa monica was uh, third street promenade and, and looking at, you know, how that it, that's longer, of course, that's longer than Rundle Mall, but the um, the makeup and the scale is, you know, really magnificent what they've done there. And I was starting to try and pitch some of the um, comparisons with Rundle Mall and Adelaide and seeing, now, what could we do that, you know, could be the same or could improve Rundle Mall by using some of these methods? So that was sort of one of my first entry points. <laughs> Amongst many. <laughs> so... <laughs> People may not be aware or be surprised uh, that, you know, indeed, there's been a longstanding Main Street movement in uh, throughout Australia and, in, and certainly, obviously, like South Australia. I wonder if you could speak to those um, efforts and where do you see Main Street going as a network and a movement in Australia? Yeah, I think a lot of it has been based in Victoria because Victoria, Victoria has a population of around just under 5 million in Melbourne. And uh, they've got a lot of main streets over there. And I think that's been one of the basis of where, where the things started because they had a commercial business group that um, was looking after their main streets. And then they converted um, back in um, 2007, they converted over to Main Street Australia. And I'd always been a member of, of their group. And we talked about what could we do something in the other states across Australia and, you know, where could we start? And they said, well, why don't we... Um, hold a Main Street Australia, like a national conference in Adelaide, and then see if we can get enough interest from different people um, to come along and say, okay, this is what it looks like, and here's what we can learn, and, and could we start something here? So uh, in 2011, we actually held a conference in Adelaide in the, the National Wine Centre, and um, that started things. That actually um, brought people together, and from that, we actually founded the group in uh, late 2011 and then um, since then we've continued on with conferences and awards programs uh, from that basis. Yeah, putting out a lot of great uh, content. Content. If you ever want to connect and see more of what's happening, they are on LinkedIn, and you can you can actually follow a lot of the work that's happening in in South Australia. So a little plug there for the team, and you can also follow David, of course. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yeah, I, th I think I was going to say one thing that we try to do is make sure that we're focusing on the main streets in the CBD, but also in the suburbs and also in the country, making yeah. sure that they're included. Exactly. Um, 
Could you tell us a little bit about how main streets are sort of set up in, in South Australia? I mean, we, I wouldn't say we've got a formula here by any means in, in the U S but largely a lot of like, you know, nonprofits and they have boards and, you know, management. Could you tell us a little bit about how they're, they're set up and kind of the, the kind of programming that they would do? A lot of them are set up using with council. We, you know, the local council, the municipalities. You need them to be supporting generally the main street to to get programs running, and they sort of vary in their uh, life cycles as to how they progress over time. And um, some, you know, have been really, really active, and the councils really got involved and put a lot of commitment into it and and funding. Um, others have sort of um, been going along with the property owners and the businesses, trying to work out getting programs together and some are very successful and some of them are still working quite hard at it and uh, so th there's various um, you know different models around that go all the way from sort of committees of council which are within the council structure to um, subsidiaries that start to release a little bit of ownership and get the businesses involved and then there's business associations so they're, they're fairly independent but some of them have funding and some don't. And I think the basis is, you know, making sure that you've got some good resources there so that they can deliver programs that they're talking about. Um, because otherwise I think it gets a bit frustrating when they um, would love to do things and there's just not enough funding to actually deliver. Yeah. They, they, I mean, the same exists everywhere, right? You know, the, having enough funding to have the capacity to deliver the service and sort of like the chicken or the egg sometimes. I, I wonder in terms of how those programs are, are viewed by the municipality, by consumers, um, it, do they, are they doing more sort of like promotional and marketing activities? Do you, do you feel like they're viewed as, as economic developers or economic development groups spurring and supporting small business development? Or has any of that positioning sort of shifted over the years in your mind? Yeah, I think, for, I think from an economic development point of view, that's really how the councils can link in because they um, – some of them don't actually have like a, a large department, you know, to just look after economic development. So they might have one person trying to link up and be the um, the link person into council. But generally it's based like that. But marketing is a very important part of it, I think. And they, um, you know, trying to attract more customers. And because we have a very active shopping centre market over here that's, um, you know, has grown very good at attracting customers, very good at um, marketing themselves and promoting themselves. And to be competitive, you know, a lot of the main streets, you know, need to work together to be able to put an offer out there to the customers to attract them. So it's really important they do have a really good, clear, uh, unique brand and that they have a, a marketing and promotional program that attracts customers and then, you know, through events and activities. So it, it's got to be organised and, um, you know, you've got to have resources behind it. Yeah, I'm sort of curious, David, because you, you, you are very well traveled, of course. And I'm just wondering, you know, from a consumer perspective, are the districts viewed the same way perhaps here? Like, is there a sense of like local identity that's connected to the, the districts or is there just a lot of different shopping opportunities? And so it's one of them, but it's not it's not held as sort of close about like where we live or where I work or what have you. Yeah. I, I, I was amazed at the similarities when I traveled America and the UK and, you know, the similarities are definitely there as far as, you know, the importance of having a good business mix and having attractive stores that destination stores that people will come to. And of course the, the whole shift over time towards hospitality being a really important category because you need, um, you need those cafes and outdoor um, restaurant areas out on the on the street where people enjoy the alfresco and and I think that same you know across the world is definitely a really important part of what a main street is about is having that social connection and I think now we're moving into another phase which is, of course is the importance of um, the services that we have on the street and you know that a lot of the, the business mix is made up with different services who like being in their local area and having that great connection to the community. And it's a matter of how do we include those in the program? So it becomes, you know, a hospitality, um, the cafes, all your retail and also all your service businesses. I think it's uh, an important angle that we can promote. Are you seeing much? I, I, so s certainly as it relates to kind of like the diversification 
um, of our malls or, you know, main streets here in the, in the U S that's really key. And, and I think it's one of the, in some, in some cases you even have like, you know, civic institutions where your town hall or city hall is or libraries or, or what have you. And I think it's, that's part of the kind of value add about coming to our districts is not like it's just for one thing only, but I'm also wondering, have you seen more uptick or desire um, around like housing, you know, more housing, people living there, sort of 24 seven kinds of districts. Yes, they've just released uh, um, more plans about looking at the importance of having um, higher rise, high rise buildings along the main street. And that's sort of one of the, the government's plans is actually looking at those arterial roads that are coming into the CBD and making sure that the um, the height's starting to get more three-storey, four-storey, five-storey along those main arterial roads so that they can increase the density. Um, it's become a really important uh, discussion here in Adelaide, particularly in the CBD, because the, the Lord Mayor is very keen to see the population in the CBD rise, the residential population rise in the, in the uh, square mile from around 25,000 to working up towards 50,000. And oh, they've wow. been looking at lots of different ways to actually, um, how could that happen? You know, how how would they build those buildings? Where are they going to build those buildings? But the Adelaide CBD population used to be around 50,000 going back in the 50s, uh, in the 1950s. And it's interesting, though, that the um, sort of bringing people to Adelaide, there's been quite a move here um, since COVID particularly. I mean, people could see from the busy um, eastern states of, you know, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, very, very busy cities, and they were looking towards Adelaide saying, well, Adelaide's got, you know, a population of around sort of 1.5 million. Um, how, you know, it looks like the lifestyle looks pretty good there, as you said in your intro, um, you know, it's a lovely lifestyle and all of a sudden we've had quite a bit of demand of people wanting to come here and the property prices have got, um, have increased quite dramatically. Oh, yes. Because people have said, Let, let's head over that way. And it's interesting during COVID because the main streets around Adelaide CBD did very, very well and the vacancy rate dropped by half to around 5%. And that was because people were, um, you know, looking to, go local and they had to stay home so they're out of the CBD but we didn't have a lot of lockdowns in Adelaide um, we were lucky but the main streets actually uh, reduced their vacancy rate and um, the thing now really the issue now is getting people back into the CBD and and getting those uh, city workers back and that the, the percentage is around 80 percent so we're actually doing quite well. Adelaide and Perth are both doing quite well. In yeah, terms of occupancy, around. David? In terms yeah, of like yeah, commercial yeah, workers, office workers, occupancy? Yep, yep okay. office vacancy. Um, and, well, sorry, occupancy. But there's been also a lot of um, offices have been built in this same period. So there's a lot of shifting mm -hmm. going on around the CBD of people moving from sort of B, B grade up to A grade. And it's so there's been a bit of a shift. And I think there's still we're still going through a stage there. But Adelaide has got quite a few people back. But the thing has happened is, of course, is same, same in UK and America, I imagine, is the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are yes. the busy three days. And we've sort of become a, a sort of three-day week. And it's changed yeah. the dynamics quite dramatically. So we're still working on how to get people to um, come more consistently and then getting them to, you know, still, you know, go out on a Thursday night is, instead of your Friday night. Uh, you know, how do you do that? It's, it's yeah. really an interesting challenge. Yeah. I mean, it's a, there's a lot of transitions happening, I think, in some of the bigger CBDs across the, the, the world, uh, in fact, because of the changing nature of work um, that was not only a U.S. or an Australia thing. It was a global uh, phenomenon in many respects. Um, I wonder if you could sort of um, compare or contrast um, what you've seen in Adelaide, of course, but – um, there, there, to your point, there are a number of kind of like rural programs emerging. Could you talk a little bit about what small town sort of CBDs or small town main streets are, are like in South Australia and, and perhaps how they're different from your work, certainly and uh, historically in Adelaide? Yeah, so I've done quite a bit of work in some of the regional towns and they – I think their biggest challenge at the moment is um, getting their workforce to come back, getting people to go to the regional areas. So you're talking out of, out of the CBD, you're talking, you know, two, three hours away into a country region. 
which may have a main street there with, it still might have around 250, 300 different stores, uh, different shops, retail, hospitality, um, probably a bit more of a mix of some larger um, larger stores, you know, like electrical stores and, and things like that. But those stores are changing a lot too. There's been, you know, a lot of movement around with, um, you know, the cost of doing business and, and people setting up and transport costs and things like that. But, um, yeah, the small regional centres are really um, getting trying to get more focus on them to try and help and get some of their workforce back in there to help them, especially the hospitality, to uh, to get people to come back. But even in the CBD, you know, and, that, and, I, and I noticed that in the UK as well and, and uh, in Canada was that um, getting hospitality workers back after COVID has been has been a struggle because people have gone elsewhere and a lot of the owners are back in the businesses working there and trying to uh, attract more staff. It's, it's been quite an issue. Yeah, we, we, we had a number of, um, I mean, the highest quit rates um, in terms of leaving the workforce was in sort of the, the hospitality, food, um, accommodations um, sectors of the the economy, and I think a lot of that was also you know there was just shifting in like wage levels as well, you know especially like here in the U.S. and like logistic positions and that kind of shipping because everyone was like having orders coming to their homes, <laughs> and so like fulfillment warehousing became a, a really big thing, and it was easy to find uh, additional jobs at uh, much higher pay pay scales. Yeah, I think it will settle down now. It's starting to settle down, I think, because people are, uh, you know, relooking at where they're going, and I think everybody's realised what the issue is and saying, okay, we've got to, we've got to start to deal with this and actually address it. Yeah. Um, do you, well, one of the things I, I wanted to to talk about a little bit, you know, aside from the Main Street CBD uh, sort of, you know, compare and contrast, was also on the small business side and and. I'm just wondering, you know, in a post-COVID era where we're, I think we're starting to get some some new norms, what's some of the shifting that you've seen in terms of small businesses and, and how they operate now, perhaps, uh, versus how they operated, uh, you know, pre-2020? I think a lot of them are running quite lean. I, I think they've really, you know, really had a look at how they're running the business and looking at the areas that they um can follow through on that will, will make the money just keep them going. Um, I think they've had to sort of, you know, cut very closely and it's going to be interesting to see how they generate growth. I know that from some of the surveys I've seen that um, one of the areas that does need increasing is the marketing and that, and I think the benefits of the, the main street marketing together and, and, and forming partnerships and working in collaboration is really, really important. And, and I think that's what has got to come in the future is the small business, you know, realising that, you know, main streets are a great opportunity, great location to set up, but you've got to um, make sure that you're looking outside the store and you're working with the retailers next door to you and the other businesses and you can't just operate in isolation. I think the, the most, most successful streets are uh, partnership streets that are working together. And I think that's a really important category, uh, sorry, area that they've got to look at, but also looking at, their, of course, they're watching their cost savings very closely and making sure that, um, you know, they're keeping their costs down. Because we sort of, you know, cost of living crisis is sort of affecting people here. I know I've, I've heard that in the, in the UK a lot because my daughter lives over there and the same commentary, you know, um, cost of power, utilities, you know, running a business is, is uh, not cheap anymore. And I don't know that it ever was, but you know, look, looking at how do they how do they reduce those costs so that they run at a really efficient rate is is a really important um, angle to take. Yeah, I mean, I think the 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 real commonality is just this thinning margins um, for all businesses. You know, costs going up on you know the the obviously the expense side and. Here in the U.S., retail's been running at maybe three percent growth, three and a half percent growth. But you really have to kind of like dive deeper into those numbers and and see that nearly half of that growth was because of e-commerce growth. So if you're not sort of in the in the digital or at least in a bricks and clicks kind of game, you, you the brick side of you you may be you know slightly flat um especially when you count in sort of inflationary pressures but i wonder if 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 you have seen as as well is 
um, with that note of bricks and clicks. I mean, there was a Salesforce prediction that came out. It was basically if you were a bricks and clicks business, you would grow at 1.5 times the rate of a bricks or clicks, you know, separate, not having, you know, both of them. And I think, you know, in many respects for the first time from a Main Street perspective that a perceived competitor is is actually an opportunity. But you, you also have to have sort of the digital skill set or the mindset to kind of move in that direction. I wonder if that's been a big push for Main Streets and small businesses in South Australia and where you're familiar in terms of like just digital transformation and, and, and getting online. Yeah, I think um, it probably hit Victoria more than us. You know, I think Main Street Australia did a lot of work there with the uh, with digital programs because they, a lot of their businesses were locked down for quite a long time. They, okay. you know, were sort of uh, over 250 days um, of lockdown, so they were a very limited market. That was dur- during the COVID period. And so there was a lot of programs that were introduced into the Main Streets, but they were were really based on a lot of digital work about how to get to your local customers and how to do it really effectively and build up your database and make sure you're working them really hard. In in South Australia, we're also on the same program of helping um, the small businesses with their digital. But it's really interesting here that the um, and and in Australia is the digital hasn't quite grown as fast as they they were predicting. So obviously there was a really big increase during COVID, but because it, yeah. it previously was about 10%, it jumped to probably around 15, but it's come back to around 12 and is is sitting fairly steady at the moment. And I think some of the predictions of uh, online growth was going to be in fresh food and that the supermarkets would really dramatically increase their their market share through online, and it quite ha- it hasn't quite moved the same speed that they thought it would. Um, so it's been a little bit um, controlled, and people are being uh, yeah a little bit calm about that. So that, and, and more reserved about that growth in that area. But um, so it stayed very fairly steady on the retail side. Um, but the fresh food, I think, is there in the future will grow. But I think it's just a lot slower than people were predicting. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I would think we're we're probably about six to seven percent higher in terms of the e-commerce. But to to your very point, it, it, the the growth has certainly um, uh, flatted a, l- a little bit. It's not certainly the pace that it was in twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one. Uh, for sure. I mean, I think we've reached some new norm growth uh, <laughs> across the the retail s- sectors. Um, what about in, just in terms of technology adoption? I mean, this is a, a bit, it was hard to go through 2024 and it still is without not seeing like an article on artificial intelligence and, or something along <laughs> yes. those lines. Certainly it's social media continues to be a a huge part of the of the retail and consumer adoption. I'm just wondering how that is uh, in Australia as well. Yeah, definitely. I, I think the AI has just been talked about, you know, thoroughly. It is just it is on the agenda, and I think the businesses are really. It almost takes you back to when digital started to become. Uh, and online started to really become prevalent and small businesses realised they had to do something and they were trying to work out now which which one are we going to choose? Are we, you know, Twitter, Facebook, you know, what are we what are we going to do here? And I think it's sort of come to that again is, you know, um, what are we going to do with AI? How are we going to include that? Um, and But the thing about the digital is really, really fascinating is that I think originally when it sort of came out, people said, well, this will be... Um, it should be fairly easy to do. It's fairly cost efficient and we can just um, yeah, put out a few posts here and there. I, I don't think they quite realised about how you have to be so efficient at it and you have to be constantly feeding the consumer because the demand is just huge and they just continuously want more and more information. And then you've got a balance that you're not overdoing it. Um, it's a really delicate balance of you know managing your customers and providing them with the latest information at, at a sort of control speed. And uh, so, yeah, I think there's, it's certainly AI has been right on the agenda and there's been um, some programs, people talking about it here and saying, now, how do we, how do we uh, include that in our Main Street uh, programs? Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, I think we're starting to see some greater adoption of AI, especially as it comes to like social media because of the ease of, you know, just, hey, I need 
I need X, Y, Z, you know, on Facebook, write me something. This is for customers and describe them. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you give it enough prompts, uh, it'll practically do, save you a couple hours at least in terms yes. of time. So it, I, I think it can certainly be advantageous, but I can understand sort of the nerves uh, behind it as, as well. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, as we um, sort of think about the, the, the common bonds, um, I, I'm wondering if there's certain things that you feel from a management per, per, uh, perception, like are consistent from all of your travels, like, I don't want to think of it. This is kind of like a formula, like you need these five things, but I suspect through going so many districts that you visited that there's some commonality about success. And I wonder from your th thinking, what, what that includes. Yeah, I think it comes back to the, uh, the main street America, uh, program there of having organization as being one of the key cornerstones. And, you know, that follows really on from my, you know, the management of the shopping centres and managing around the mall and, and how I was looking at that angle. But I think that the the management and the organisation of a main street is absolutely critical. The governance model has to be right. And uh, just recently, just here in Adelaide, I just ran a masterclass on governance and we talked about um, can, how do you engage people? You know, how do you get them involved? And how do you, and how do you make sure that the uh, property owners and the businesses are not just saying to council, you know, you can do it. You know, we're paying our council rates. Just get on with this Main Street program. Um, they've got to be really, really involved in the program and engaged in it. And, it, and, uh, and I think the best model I've seen is the, the Business Improvement District model. And, and back in 2005, I went to Philadelphia and I was um, stayed with Paul Levy for a week over there. And, and I, was, I was just blown away by the detail and how they were – you know, looking after the streets and how they manage the security and manage the cleaning and their marketing programs. I said, this has got to be the way. And um, I've been, when I came back to Australia, I sort of continually been promoting this. And I think there was a little bit of resistance. I think people sort of, uh, what do, you know, how does this work? You know, what do you mean? Like, you know, is that, um, you know, how do they sort of manage the whole street? You know, which part of it and which part don't they manage? Um, and I said, but just the improvements for the customer, that that's just... Yet what I came back to is just that the customer is the, the beneficiary of these business improvement districts. And so recently I was just in uh, Toronto and Canada where they, they started the first uh, business improvement area back in 1970. And, uh, and they really, what happened there was that they, the businesses said, nobody is actually giving us any funds to help us just look after our street. Like the, everybody's distracted by there's this, this uh, area over here needs attention, that needs attention, the government's spending money over here. How do we get something for ourselves? And they, they got the businesses and property owners to come together and they, they raised in the first year about $47,000 and then started a Main Street beautification program. And uh, it's a really beautiful street. They've done a lot of work. And, of course, that's, that was, um, you know, 50 years ago and they've had to renew the program, had to renew the program 10 times, you know, uh, for each five years. But what I like about it is that the, the thing about the business improvement district's approach and the business improvement areas is the vote because the vote means that people are solidly committed to being in that program, you know, because otherwise it's just, you know, sort of gestures and we feel like we'd like to be part of it if it's a good program, whereas because the bids are organised, you know, with legislation behind it, the, the vote actually carries the mantra of the, um, you know, the majority of businesses in the street and property owners say, we want to try this program and, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to try this, we're going to improve this, but we're going to ask you first what you want and then we're going to deliver and you can measure on us. And then after five years, if you don't like it, like it let's stop the program. But because they, they see all the programs they get provided and it's so organised, that um, you know, I think over 90, 95%, 96% of the UK programs have all been renewed um, multiple times, multiple That's times. That's an amazing and stat. So mm -hmm. I think it's um, – and, and the other thing is too is that the number of people who vote for the, uh, the business plan proposal that's put up, often you'll get around 55 60% of businesses get involved and actually it's a voluntary vote and you've got them all uh, voting – um, to say let's let's try this let's let's have a crack at this and um, yeah I'm I'm absolutely um, 
100% behind business improvement districts. And I think, so we've only got our first one in Australia happened last year, and that was in the waterfront in Sydney. So that was the first really? one we've ever had. Yes, I, I was talking a lot, but not getting that far. But now, now we might be <laughs> starting to get somebody. <laughs> it takes but a little while sometimes. <clears throat> it does take a while for those ideas to get in. But, yes, yeah, so the waterfront is uh, up and running in Sydney. And then they've also, what I like about it is they've started 10 pilot programs. And the pilot programs really demonstrate what the benefits are. And then the community can say, and the business community can say, this is a really good idea. Let's keep on doing this. This really works. And it gives them that taste of what it's about. So, yeah, I'm really hopeful that those programs that have started in Sydney will then will flow on and, uh, you know, across the other states, across Australia. So that that's what I'm sort of pushing for because I really believe in it. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a it's a funny model that can work for lots of different places at bigger scale, smaller scale, scale. Certainly here in the U.S., we've got everything from downtown development authorities to business improvement districts and other sort of um, uh, legislatively enhanced funding tools that many districts utilize as whether it's for infrastructure, in some cases operating. So it, it can be a, a great along with. You know, we always like to talk more about the sort of the diversity of the income stream, just like in a small business. And uh, it, it's certainly one of, one of the important ones out there. Well, I think it's important to how, how the partnership comes together, because you look in San Francisco and they've got their tourism business improvement area. And basically what they're doing there is just all the hotels have come together to say, here's what we want. We will fund that. And it's a bit in a business plan and we'll get on with the job. So it, it just they can deliver what they're actually working towards and and I think that's where they work because like you say, they work in industrial areas, they work in a main street, they work in a city centre. Um, it's a very versatile model and um, yeah, it really gets the gained. The common success. theme being sort of own, own ownership and uh, controlling yes. some of your destiny. <laughs> yep, yep, that's exactly right, yeah. David, as, as we wrap up our discussion, um, you've been at this for, for a long time. Uh, one of the stewards uh, of Main Street, um, not only in Australia, but I, I like to think globally. And uh, I was wondering what your future is for Main Street in Australia. And do you see any sort of significant trends or challenges that will, will shape its development into the future? Yeah, I think they, um, it's a big opportunity because I think that the, the shopping centres rely on a lot of their chain stores to be a part of their base of, the, of their business mix. And I think if we compare that with the main street, which is looking at independence and starting up uh, new businesses and innovation, um, that's, that's the home of innovators and independence. And I think we've got to make sure that the movement continues, that uh, main streets are the are the birthplace of small businesses and that we um, certainly promote them and support them and uh, because they provide that variety and they because they are so closely linked to the community they're really a, a key part of where the future is for our, our um, you know society really we, we need our main streets to be there and uh, so we'll, we'll keep pushing you know hard on the on the different areas of main streets to try and help them and linking in with main street america and um linking to the different groups in in the uk is really important because yeah we're all facing similar similar challenges and we, we're trying to actually help the those small businesses and the main streets to, to keep going well said david and so thankful to have you on the the podcast and uh certainly look forward to our future chats uh, together thanks for being on the show david Thank you, Matt. Thanks for the opportunity. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with David West, Principal Consultant at Premier Retail Marketing Down Under in Adelaide, South Australia. So over the last few years, I've had the opportunity to engage with David in the work of the South Australia Main Street. And while we use slightly different words uh, to describe something. For example, shopping carts are called trolleys in Australia, and they call a downtown a principal shopping district, much more formal. And there are so many cross-learning points relative to both challenges and opportunities. Movements to digital remain both a struggle and also a large growth strategy for most small businesses. And AI represents great potential for cost and time savings as we, you know, attempt to harness this new technology adoption. 
But while inherently I think we we knew this, it's just truly heartwarming to understand the importance that small businesses and communities central business districts have on maintaining and creating quality of place, not just here in the U.S., but truly across the globe. So, as always, if you're a business owner and likewise to my place professional colleagues, I hope this episode has provided plenty of new insights, solutions, and inspiration. And as consumers, you know, please continue to support your local small businesses and, of course, tell their stories. They're so important to our local and national economies, and most importantly, they provide and promote quality living to the places we all call home. And don't forget to show your Main Street pride by checking out our Main Street swag at shopmainstreet.org. That's going to do it for this week's episode. Please remember to check out our growing library of podcast recordings and other related films of the podcast on our Main Street America YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. Please rate and review us. And as always, be sure to subscribe and tell your friends, family, pets, neighbors, and colleagues. And I just want to close with a special shout out to our friends in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. I had a chance to tour and chat a bit with the marketing coordinator, Kelton Weaver, and was blown away that as part of their business networking and sharing new learning strategy, they they share out the podcast to their small business owners. Aside from my immense gratitude, we we aren't everywhere to hear firsthand about perhaps the impact or other topics you might have of interest or even additional feedback that might be helpful in making this the most effective in telling these important stories and sharing critical learnings for small business owners and entrepreneurs. So please leave a comment. It's really helpful to us. Or feel free to reach out to me directly at mwagner at mainstreet.org. Uh, we'd certainly love to hear from you. So until next time, thanks as always for your support. <laughs>